This week's episode of Discovering Trek is brought to you exclusively by Fansets. Keep listening for your special discount offer code from Fansets coming up later in this episode. Discover a whole new universe of pin collectibles with Fansets. Online at Fansets.com. An end to the war, a heartbreaking goodbye, and an unexpected hello to an old friend twice. Season one is in the books, and the finale of Star Trek Discovery did not disappoint in the slightest. Many threads were wrapped up, but a whole new one is just starting to unravel with a shocking ending to the season, cliffhanger style. Add to that a surprise cameo from a seasoned Star Trek alumni, and you just know we have got tons of stuff to discuss in this week's episode. I'm your host, Dan Davidson, and we are Discovering Trek. Welcome one and all to Discovering Trek, the Star Trek Discovery Companion, presented by Fansets. I'm your co-host Dan Davidson, and I'm honored to be here to talk Star Trek Discovery Season 1 finale with you. Klingons, Orions, twists, turns, bombs, and even more whetted our appetite for most of the episode. And then we were all shocked with an amazing end to the season. As always, this is the premiere podcast for the most in-depth discussion and analysis about the final episode of Star Trek Discovery's first season, entitled, Will You Take My Hand? And has been the case for the last 14 episodes, we were not disappointed with what we saw. And when I say we, well, it's time to introduce my amazing co-host. You know, he is known to occasionally treat himself to a yummy slab of space whale as a midday snack. And one of these days, I may just join in to see if it tastes like chicken or fish. But whatever he's chewing on, he's my special friend, my brother in Trek, and my amazing number one. He is Bill Smith. And uh, save the neck for me, Clark. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> Dan, I'm great. It's it's so good to be back. I f- oh, the poor Gormagander. I, I felt so bad. And then the look on Tilly's face, but I'm sure we'll get to that later. It's, I'm excited to be here. What a great end to the freshman season of Star Trek Discovery, and it's going to be a good time tonight. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be a great time. And you know why, Bill? Uh, it's it's a very, very special time. We're going to have another repeat guest joining us tonight. And not only is he going to be joining us for the second time, he actually took your job just a couple of weeks ago while you were traveling, and he was so good that we we had to have him come back for this finale. Absolutely, Dan. As you just mentioned, he joined us just a couple of weeks ago to sit in for me, and now he's back as a guest this time to discuss the season one finale of Star Trek Discovery. He's the co-host of Politrex on the Tricorder Transmissions Network of Podcasts, and also our great friend, Mr. Barry DeFord. Barry, welcome back to Discovering Trek, buddy. Hey, thanks for having me back. It's nice to be part of a uh, a full complement crew this time. And uh, sitting uh, sitting next to Dan was was tiresome and troubling enough. But uh, you know what? I, I bared it well, and I enjoyed it. So it's nice to see you uh, see you next to him, being the the great number one that you are. Thank Mr. you, Bill. thank you. It's good to be here. And, and well, Dan smells, so I understand. Well, well, that's okay. Well, it's good to have you back, Barry. And actually, after what Bill just said, I'm thinking you might want to think of this as maybe your second audition. Just keep that in Excellent. mind. <laughs> yes. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> it's great to have you, man. It's it's always good discussion with you. And before we get started, uh, I think Bill is opening up his communications channel to the Orion sector of Kronos to let you know how you folks can get in touch with us about episode 15. Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Hailing frequencies are open, Dan. You can find us on Twitter at Discovering Trek. And of course, on Facebook, we can be found at facebook.com slash Discovering Trek. There you can join in on the discussion and leave us comments, questions, suggestions, or even your recipes for Space Whale. Yummy. Plus, don't forget that you can also send us a voicemail directly, and now it's easier than ever. Just go to trekgeeks.com and click on the giant blue button on the right-hand side of the screen. Please do remember, though, that any comments you may leave us could be used in a future episode of Discovering Trek. Dan? Thank you, Bill. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. From here on in... 
This episode of Discovering Trek contains spoilers. So if you haven't watched episode 15 of Star Trek Discovery, stop listening right now. Go on over to CBS All Access and watch the latest episode. Failure to do that puts you at risk to find out plot developments and character details for Will You Take My Hand? <laughs> Previously on Star Trek Discovery. What? Uh, um, uh, Giorgio? A Klingon attack force is making its way to Earth as the USS Discovery plans her jump to Kronos. Captain Giorgio, wink, wink, seems a little more harsh than she used to be. Oh, right, that's because she's Terran, but nobody knows that. No one, that is, other than Saru and Burnham. They try to discuss the situation at Saru's science station, but Giorgio tells Burnham that she didn't authorize her to leave her station and then trades barbs with Saru. Burnham tries to get Giorgio to slip up and expose herself as the Terran Emperor, but she sees right through Burnham. Away from the bridge, Burnham demands to know what Giorgio's real plan is. Giorgio says that she's the only living thing giving the Federation a fighting chance to stop the Klingons. Giorgio and Burnham then go to see Laurel in the brig. To say that Laurel is surprised to see Giorgio is a bit of an understatement, considering she picked the flesh off her bones and everything. Giorgio insists Laurel tell them the best place to insert a landing party for the mission, and of course Laurel declines. Giorgio drops the force field to Laurel's cell and enters it, locking it behind her with voice print, and begins to beat the crap out of Laurel. Laurel tells Giorgio that the Federation has already lost. Burnham thinks there could be another way, and they go to visit Ash Tyler, who's in his quarters tying knots he learned as a child, because he remembers them. Knots in a piece of rope. Bolands. Like in Boy Scouts. Hmm. Maybe Voke's memories could help them with the Kronos mission. He gives them a beam in location, a cave system beneath an Orion embassy. Giorgio also wants Cadet Tilly with them on the landing party, and she can carry the mapping probe. Discovery goes to black alert, and Saru orders Stamets to jump inside of Kronos. The landing party beams into the Orion encampment. They try to make a weapons deal with an Orion using weapons from Lorca's personal armory aboard the Discovery. Tilly pretends to be hungry in order to pull Burnham aside and talk with her. Burnham has no idea what Georgia was really up to, but she plans to watch her like a hawk, and Tilly says she'll watch Burnham's back. The landing party then visits what amounts to a makeshift club with dancers. Giorgio gets a little me time with two of the dancers while Tilly guards the drone. Burnham and Tyler continue to investigate the surroundings and find a gambling game that Volk was apparently very good at. Tyler also tells Burnham about Volk being an outcast because of his rare albino skin mutation. Tyler gets into the game and is so at ease with the Klingons that it makes Burnham uneasy. An Orion man talks up Tilly in the club and talks her into inhaling something that he's smoking. Tilly does and almost immediately passes out. Hmm. If only she'd had the Tranya. Tyler returns from the game and tells Burnham that he was unable to get the information they needed. Burnham tells Tyler about her parents. They were posted at a joint human Vulcan outpost and had planned a vacation, but Burnham had begged them to stay home for a few days more so she could watch a star go supernova. That's when the Klingons attacked. She heard everything. She remembers them laughing afterward and the Klingon laughter she heard here on Kronos reminded her of it. She wishes she could hate the Klingons, but when she looks around, she sees Orions and Klingons just living their lives. Tyler seems to think that he sees some Klingons who could have some information on the shrine, and he tries to talk to them. Giorgio concludes her me time by holding dancers at gunpoint and demanding to know about the shrine. Tilly awakens just as the Orion man is trying to take her drone that's cuffed to her wrist. The Orion says the stuff she's inhaled is volcanic vapors. Hey, wait a minute. That means the volcanoes in this area are still active. That's not supposed to happen. Tilly fears the worst and opens the lock case to find a hydro bomb instead of a drone. She tells Burnham just before Giorgio shows back up and knocks Tilly out, taking the bomb. Burnham and Tyler meet up with Tilly. If the bomb goes off, Cronus will suffer a natural disaster that will make it completely uninhabitable. They contact Saru, but he can't beam up Giorgio or the bomb. Burnham now believes that this was Starfleet's plan. 
She says that they need to talk to Admiral Cornwell. Burnham speaks with her and asks Admiral Cornwell if genocide was in fact the plan. Burnham believes that Cornwell knows what she's doing is wrong, which is why it was kept secret and why Georgia was sent to Kronos. Burnham tells Cornwell that their principles are all they have. Saru stands up and reminds Cornwell that they are Starfleet, and the rest of the bridge crew stands with them. Cornwell agrees to change the plan. Burnham finds Giorgio in the shrine underneath the Orion encampment. She tells Giorgio that the plan has changed and offers Giorgio her freedom in exchange for the detonator. Giorgio refuses. Burnham says Giorgio will then have to watch Burnham die again to pull it off. Giorgio agrees to turn over the detonator at that point, and Tyler brings Laurel into the shrine. The bomb is assigned to Laurel's biosigns, and they encourage Laurel to use the bomb as leverage to reform the Klingon Empire. Tyler also tells Laurel that it's time for her to come out of the shadows and lead. Giorgio takes advantage of her freedom and leaves herself. In the Orion camp, Tyler tells Burnham that he's going to go with Laurel. They share a goodbye, and Tyler leaves, but gives her the bolin he was tying in his quarters earlier. He and Laurel beam aboard a Klingon ship, and Burnham beams back to Discovery. Laurel makes the case for a united Klingon empire before the houses and declares herself as the new leader. And the other Klingons laugh until she reveals the detonator and they get kind of quiet. She tells them that this is the beginning of the reunification of their race. So the war is over. The Klingon attack force approaching Earth changes course to head back home. Burnham returns to Earth where she meets with Amanda outside Federation headquarters in Paris. Burnham reminds her of the time she told her not to forget her humanity, and she says now that she finally understands. Sarek joins them and speaks with Burnham. Sarek admits to Burnham that he had a part in the Federation's plot to destroy Kronos. Sarek then opens a box and presents Michael with a Starfleet Delta. He tells her that her record has been expunged, and she's been given a full pardon with reinstatement. She is once again Commander Michael Burnham. The Discovery will also have a new captain who is presently on Vulcan, and Sarek will make the journey with them. Burnham speaks during a medal ceremony for the Discovery crew, where many are promoted, and all receive medals for their conduct. Discovery departs the galaxy headed to Vulcan the old-fashioned way, via warp speed. The spore drive for now is mothballed until a non-human interface can be found to run the drive, and Stamets is okay with that. Then Discovery receives a Priority 1 distress call. It's from a Starfleet vessel, but the communication is garbled. It takes a while to determine the point of origin, but the registry number is NCC17. They're being hailed by Captain Pike. A ship with a familiar configuration comes closer. It's the USS Enterprise, and she's come to a stop directly in front of the USS Discovery as the screen goes to black. You know, you know, man, it's it's hard to believe that we're not going to hear these melodic and mellifluous recaps for upwards of a whole year. Uh, as always, nicely done. Good job for the last time this season. Well, I don't know if it'll be that long, but uh, it, uh, it'll be different not to have to write one of these next week. That's for sure. <laughs> well, you always do a great job in writing, man. I I, re, I'm, I appreciate it, and I'm sure all the listeners appre- appreciate it. So uh, let's uh, let's get started, shall we? Episode 15, season finale. Let's get some high level thoughts on the episode. Thumbs up or thumbs down, and very high level general reactions. And so we'll start with you, Barry, as our guest of honor this week. What did you think about the uh, finale this week? Well, thank you for for giving me a, a guest of honor spot. That makes me feel like I'm I'm getting the the royal treatment at the Orion Bar there and uh, <laughs> getting some some extra extra attention. Uh, none of that volcanic gas, though. Thank you very much. I liked I liked this episode. I loved all of the other ones recently, so I think it's it is a thumb up, thumb down for me. And this is this is sort of a syndrome sometimes. I think that happens with with really good storytelling is the buildup is so amazing. Sometimes you build it up in your head and in your heart so much that it's almost impossible to satisfy every single thing. And so I think the writers have been knocking it out of the park every single time. They've been doing such a good job. And 
to their detriment, that almost makes us expect like some kind of amazing explosion, super duper thing. And I mean, they only teased us with the blowing up of uh, Konos there. So I would say, yeah, it's a thumb up and a thumb down. The things that I thumb down was I wish this was a two part ending. And that's selfish because it would give me an extra bit of time to watch more discovery. I also think that the end of the war was a tad on the rushed side. And I found Laurel's whole arc ended kind of abruptly as well. The positives, though, are definitely like the visuals, those visuals of the ships and stuff and like zooming into Konos and all that stuff is is amazing. I don't know if I'm pronouncing Konos correctly. So they're, they're saying Kronos and then they say like Konos. So we'll, we'll go with that. I love the humor. Tilly's little little salute to the emperor. I love the cameos. The sadness of the goodbyes too, like um, Burnham and, and Ash, knowing that just the, this ain't this ain't gonna work. It, it was amazing, and obviously the the setups, and obviously later Bill, especially. I know it's the your favorite enterprise is the TMP Enterprise, and uh, I wouldn't mind getting an Isaac for your thoughts on that. But I think we'll be talking about that later. <laughs> well, it's interesting that a lot of what you just said about your high level thoughts of the episode echo what I say i've loved all 14 episodes we've seen so far and i'm gonna give this one a thumbs up but only a lukewarm thumbs up to be honest um i'm gonna say my overall opinions on why for a little later on but up until the last five minutes of the episode it was just okay for me um you mentioned some things about how the war wrapped up very quickly and we'll get into that also but i gotta say The last five minutes were perhaps the most excited I have ever been regarding Star Trek, and it really saved the episode for me. So I will give it a thumbs up. Bill? You know, I have to say that for me, I was thumbs down until that last 15 minutes of the episode. And I feel like they tried to jam a whole lot into this episode and tie it all up really quickly, almost kind of like a Voyager episode, because it seems like so many of those ended in the last 90 seconds. And, and things mm-hmm. were resolved off screen. And I feel like this episode suffered a, a bit because of that. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in just a minute in the discussion points. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the word Voyager will come up in my uh, discussion uh, later. And and I'm, I'm getting a – so all three of us are kind of along those same lines with – we talked last week, Bill, that we thought that this finale should be maybe 90 minutes, if not longer, because they had so much to wrap up. So – I was quite surprised when it was only 45 minutes and change. So, yeah. So, well, let's keep going. We got a lot to talk about. Uh, The first thing I want to bring up, Barry, you mentioned it a few minutes ago, and that is, of course, as with every episode that she's in, let's talk about Tilly. She was phenomenal yet again. Um, She steals every scene that she's in, and I loved the humor. And you pointed out my favorite moment maybe of the episode with her Barry was that little salute to the emperor when she realized who it was uh it was it was just hysterical what did you think about that it was it was very much just yeah Mary Wiseman just owning the role I think she has every other character I find has sort of known what they wanted to become and I found that that Tilly knew who she was from the beginning to the very end. And I think she discovered, to, to use the title, I guess, she sort of discovered herself, but always kind of knew who she was on the inside. And, you know, that little bit of self-effacing, self-deprecation, but then also sort of a, a, a inner confidence when she needs to tell that Orion what's up in when they're down in that market with Georgiou. It was like, oh, okay, yeah, no, she knows she knows where she's at. She knows what's going on. Um, when she's willing to put herself into danger and when she's willing to really put herself into danger when she realizes the the truth behind that probe. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. She owns she owns every every scene she's in. And, you know, a couple of my friends were saying that, oh, you know, I like Mary Wiseman when when she straightens that hair. I know some girls who do have to straighten their hair, and it is not easy. And I have to say, I am curly hair. Uh, team curly hair, Mary Wiseman, because you be you girl. You're awesome. Hashtag curly hair. Okay. I like that. I would say that, but I don't have any hair. So we'll just move on. Uh, Bill, one of the things that I thought was really great, Barry just talked about it was the interaction that she had on the planet. She's always very nervous and always talks too much, but when she needed to play the part and put that phase pistol in that girl's face, that was a Tilly that I would not want to have to deal with. And, And of course, her scenes with a certain Star Trek legend 
uh, were just phenomenal. I thought. What did you think? Oh, I agree with you. Uh, going back to the the scene, you know, where she essentially had to put the the gun in the in the alien's face. You know, Tilly Tilly knows what to do in the moment, and she gets over some of that insecurity and some of that awkwardness. And when it's it's time to to be Starfleet, she can be Starfleet. And I think that's one of the great things about this character. I, I she's been us all along in, in many ways, from her her awkwardness to her humor to her her genuine reactions to things. And in this case, I, I think that she still very much was us. Now, with regards to her scenes with <laughs> with Clint Howard, I think I went nuts when I saw Clint on the TV, and I I first started imitating Baylock going and McCoy and Bailey, but first <laughs> the Tranya, and I just was having so much fun, and and the fact that he offered her something uh, right after I did my Tranya impersonation was was even better. Such a great <laughs> little cameo. Um, you know, an Easter egg for, for TOS fans of all ages. And it was, it was a really, really great scene. It was a great scene. And, um, one of the things that I was hoping they had done, you, you referenced Tranya is it would have been kind of cool if he was drinking Tranya while he was talking to Tilly, yeah. that would have just yeah. been the ultimate, uh, callback to TOS. So let's, let's talk about that for a little bit, that whole Orion section on the Klingon homeworld. Um, Bill, let me ask you this. I thought it was a little strange that the Orions had this whole area that was given to them, quote unquote, for them to build on by the Klingon Empire. And if I'm not mistaken, it was built on the ruins of a sacred land, if I heard that right. I found that a little strange. What did you think? Yeah, I have to agree with you here. This is one of the aspects of this script that I just don't understand. And uh, if I remember the writing credit correctly, and I could have this wrong, I believe the teleplay was by Akiva Goldsman and, and by Gretchen and Aaron, um, the other two executive producers, um, Gretchen Berg and Aaron Harberts. And I, I think there were a lot of choices in this script I just didn't agree with, but that was one of the things I didn't understand. Why would the Klingons, for whom honor is everything, allow pirates, which is essentially what the Orions are? to build a quote unquote embassy. And I mean that in the loosest sense of the word on land that is considered sacred. It absolutely makes no sense to me. Yeah, it was, it was one of the things that I was kind of scratching my head about, but I was able to overlook it because we saw some pretty cool stuff when we were uh, being shown that Orion section. If I'm not mistaken, those critters being fried on a plate were very uh, reminiscent of the slugs in Conspiracy and Commander Remick. And I was freaking out a little bit about that. And my wife and brother-in-law and sister were like, what is his problem? <laughs> but it was just one of the <laughs> It's just one of those moments that I thought was great. They, they're able to throw these nuggets into these episodes. We saw Trills. And, of course, like you just mentioned, Bill, Clint Howard. Uh, it's so great to see him now in his fourth Star Trek series. Of course, he was Baylock, which we talked about when he was seven years old. We've seen him as a Ferengi on Enterprise. We have seen him as the crazy guy Grady on Deep Space Nine and Past Tense Part Two. Yep. So I was thrilled to see him uh, one more time now as an Orion. And Barry, uh, did you have the same reaction when you saw Clint Howard when you realized who it was? Yeah, he did that lip curl, that that sort of <laughs> characteristic lip curl. And I went, I I was sitting down with a very nice family again who brought me into their house to watch watch Star Trek because I I up here in Canada we have a we can see it on satellite, but I cut my cord along a long time ago. So I watch it on Crave TV, which is sort of like our all access, but it it drops on Monday. So we get it very late. So I did that. But I was there, I was watching and I was eating pie and I jumped up and I'm like, Clint Howard. And they're like, who? And I'm like, he was Baylock. And they're like, who? I'm like, from the Corbomite maneuver. They're like, what? I'm like, oh, and I just sat back down. But I was so excited. It was, uh, it was great. It was great to have him there. It's always good when we have things like this, that, that people who are so into Trek can see these things and just love so much about what they've done by getting these people to come back on the show. So, Bill, let me ask you this in regards to the Orion section again. Was there any other things that you saw uh, in that area of the planet that you liked or that you disliked? Because there was a lot going on in there. There was a lot going on. I kind of loved the sort of holographic tattoo shop. I thought that was an interesting uh, element to add to Star Trek. I thought that the um, the public urination scene was a little odd. 
I'm not going to lie because I lost count of the number of streams. Well, uh, Klingons do have uh, extra organs, I think they said. So who knows? Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> um, uh, although uh, I thought it was handled well, I thought that it it certainly provided you know, some context for the viewers to how different this place was, right? So I think it's funny that you say it was handled well, but we won't talk <laughs> about that. <laughs> oh, we're descending. Multitasking. Into yeah, yeah, we're descending now. <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I thought it was an interesting locale, but it really it wasn't unlike that uh, that first destination in Broken Bow in Star Trek Enterprise, where mm-hmm. eventually they go and, and Trip and T'Pol are sitting there and Trip's yelling at the lady to let her kid breathe and she's trying to wean him off the, the oxygen, as it were. Right. Um, so it had that element and I thought it was okay. I just still am mystified as to why it was on Kronos. If I could uh, jump in on that, I actually have an insight. So... The Klingons base some of their their history and their their you know lore off of Japanese culture. And Jap- Japan for uh, three hundred years was an isolationist culture, except for a small part of the city of Nagasaki, and a very honor bound you know proud culture that you know really is insular allows this one area that they actually referred to as an area you could do what's called Dutch studies, and it had a lot of sort of European feel to it. That's where all of the Dutch, because they were the only people who were allowed to go there, could work and do different sorts of things. And a lot of those Dutchmen were in fact privateers, which is a fancy word for pirate. So I'm wondering if maybe our writers have done something kind of historical here and tied in the idea that, you know, though the Klingons do sort of have a bit of a Japanese sort of feel to them, maybe that's the historical context that we can get where a proud culture who you would think this is the last thing that they would do. In fact, there is historical evidence of a culture much like that, allowing a group of you know, barbarians or gaijin, as the Japanese would call them, to live among them in a very controlled small space. Um, so, Bill, this is why your job is in jeopardy. <laughs> we get a history lesson when Barry is on the show. Um, I'll be waiting next time for what you can contribute. This is this is why Barry hosts Politrex and we host Tricks, <laughs> which is a lot of us mocking each other. So that's that's true. That was fantastic, that's Barry. So- Thanks, that sir. was really great. No, in all seriousness, that was really cool. And and who knew? So th- that's pretty cool. Barry did. Um, yeah. Barry did. Uh, that's true. That he's smarter than both of us combined. Uh, let's <laughs> let's touch on a subject that I think may be the um, sensitive point for what we saw in this week's episode, and that's the war itself. Uh, the entire season has been about the Klingon war. Even when they were in the mirror universe, uh, they needed to get back to help win the war. Um, so I want to get you guys' thoughts on how this was handled in the story. Uh, I'll start by saying, what was Starfleet thinking? Uh, you know, Bill, you warned us last week that putting Empress Giorgio in command would be a very bad thing. And that was pretty evident about two seconds into this episode. Yeah, it, uh, it really was. I, you know, I thought it would prove true a little later. But as soon as she started trading barbs with Saru about tough Kelpian and and being unpalatable, <laughs> I realized this is this is really not going to go well. Like quickly, this is going to go south. Mm-hmm. I um, I, you know, I, I'm going to take a step back here and look at how this came about. And and Dan, I know you've loved the Mirror Universe episodes. I know you're a huge Mirror Universe fanboy, and I appreciate that. But I at this point, I think it was a really big mistake for Discovery to spend four episodes in the Mirror Universe because I think it took away from resolving this war along the kind of arc that it needed. And I think that this episode suffered as a result. Instead, we got sort of 30 minutes of, let's wrap up the war. And it happened almost in a kludge together fashion. The I think the Georgiou element was great. I think we could have done maybe one less episode in the mirror universe and provided a little more tension and context there because by the time you got to the scene with Michael and Philippa uh, in the uh, in the uh, the shrine it, it seemed kind of underwhelming if that makes sense. I can appreciate that. I think on uh, for me, I think it would have been better if possibly Discovery was 16 episodes so that we could still have that four episode mirror universe arc because i think that arc was very well done and it was complete i'm afraid that if we did three episodes the mirror universe arc would have ended up being what we're seeing with how the war wrapped up where it was a little bit too quick but good point and and i appreciate it one of the things that i thought was 
something that I was not a fan of, and Barry, I'd like to get your thoughts on it, is they just let her go. And as we saw with A, when Burnham brought her to this side, when she grabbed her in the transporter beam, and then B, when Cornwell and Sarek allowed her to be com- in command of the Shenzhou and of this of discovery and of this mission, just letting her go, I can't help but think that that's going to come back in season two or later and cause problems. What do you think, Barry? Absolutely. She is the next big villain. She's she's taking Lorca, Lorca's place and she's not going to be as underhanded, but she is definitely going to be appealing to some tough customers out in the the non-Federation parts of, of the uh, galaxy. I guess like I agree with Bill that we might have done with one fewer episode, but I also selfishly wish that we had one more episode. But I guess... I think about it sort of as like a long walk for a short drink of water. And I mean that pun intended, because when we start this whole series, we have Georgiou and Burnham basically kind of breaking general order one to get these people some water by blowing up that well and getting the water to come out. And when they do that, eventually it leads to Georgiou's death. And in this case, we have a mirroring where Georgiou's life is saved, and then she almost drops a bomb down a much larger well, and instead of water, we get lava. And so I think that was what the writers were intending. But yeah, it rushed it so much at the end there that I think a lot of people might have even missed that connection. And that was sort of frustrating to me. And and yeah, the war ends like bada bing, bada boom. And then the Klingons are like, there's Earth. Well, let's turn around, guys. It's frustrating. I, I, I wish we could have had a little bit more. We get a history lesson, and we get a Deep Space Nine episode reference from Barry in the same episode. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> I, I am so fired. <laughs> yes. No, no, you're not. Not yet. But just I teach I breath. teach high school English language arts. I'm 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 paid to tear stuff apart. So, <laughs> uh, Bill uh, Barry brought up something that I know you were just dying to talk about. So I'm just going to preface it with the bomb. And and the bomb was not the bomb, was it? Was it? I mean, okay. So let's let's review. So I think we all figured out before that thing ever got cut off at Tilly's arm that it wasn't a bomb, right? Because why would Giorgio really be okay with that? You know, she's she's a woman who essentially, you know, uh, single handedly defeated the Klingon Empire. So why would she be interested in flying a drone? Yeah, no, probably not. So the bomb. Um, they've given this bomb to Laurel to say, here, you can use this to gain control of the Klingon Empire. This bomb is in an active volcano. How long is it going to sit there and be okay? Because um, I, I got to think at some point, the bomb, she go boom. <laughs> <laughs> what if what if Laurel trips? Like if she's like, I am the king, and then beep, and then boom, and that's it. It's terrifying to think. <laughs> or, you know, once... Once Laurel gets the bomb, Laurel has no deal with Giorgio. Why doesn't Laurel right. stun Giorgio and say, you're now a prisoner of the Klingon Empire? <laughs> yeah, there's that's something that I wanted to bring up in my in my discussion about the war. Um I'll 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 get to that in just a second. Okay. You mentioned this a moment ago, Bill, in regards to your thumbs up or thumbs down, and you said that it reminded you of a Voyager episode. Yeah. And yeah. when for the war section of the conversation, I I think that this this is what I wrote. I think that this episode suffered from what I like to call Voyager writer's syndrome. And it, the great ideas for the episode. And then it's like, oh, my God, we've only got 10 minutes to wrap this thing up. We better do it really nice and really neat so that the episode will end and that we're not over the a lot of time frame, which is why this episode should have been longer than 45 minutes. Yeah. It made me scratch my head a little. And I got to say, like both of you just said, Laurel is now, as a Klingon, she is basically holding the entire Empire hostage with the big red button. Her button's bigger than everybody else's, and she could, she has the power now to destroy that planet if she wanted to, which kind of also doesn't make sense because then she'd be blowing up her own planet. It, 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 there were too many questions in my mind into that aspect of this episode to really figure out exactly where my biggest problem is with it. Does that make sense, Bill? Yeah, I think it absolutely makes sense. You know, it's um, it's you've got a long list of things you got to tie off. And instead of letting some just spill over, they each uh, Akiva Goldsman tried to tie a good chunk of them off. It sounds like, and it it doesn't seem like it 
it worked out too well. I mean, I'm still waiting for him to come back to us about the black badges, and I think that ship has sailed. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really too bad because I think all three of us really were looking forward to getting an answer into what those are. But you know, we've got we've given the faith, we have the faith of these writers that they are going to answer questions like this. So maybe this is one that we'll see later on in season two because I have a feeling that season two is going to start off with a bang. So let's talk about that ending, guys, because oh my god, that was unbelievable. My wife was sitting there next to me and when they went to warp she she grabbed my arm she goes something's wrong something's not right here and then all of a sudden we saw what we saw it is a cliffhanger that i just absolutely loved it wasn't like best of both worlds where you're like oh my god what is going to happen i just loved it i just loved the scene the special effects were great um i was literally jumping up and down in the living room of my sister's house looking like a fool and i'm not embarrassed about it um let's get your just off the top thoughts on what that final scene meant to you guys and barry let's start with you well the first episode of the original series i ever saw was with my grandfather it was the doomsday machine and i remember looking at the enterprise and being like what a cool looking weird looking spaceship and ever since then i've had a love affair with just that design right so from from the constitution to you know the the excelsior to the galaxy to the you know like going on just seeing that variation that design has always been something near and dear to my heart and seeing both the faithfulness and also the slight changes that they made to the enterprise it was both seamless and nostalgic at the same time and yeah i was there and just kind of glassy eyed going oh there she is there she is (laughs) it was beautiful after the episode ended, I was frantically trying to rewind uh, the episode so I could watch that scene again. But I'm not familiar with how my sister's Apple TV works. So I ended up starting the episode over <laughs> and couldn't fast forward it. So I'm like, oh, there'll be pictures on Facebook in a few minutes. So I I'll just tell you waited. what your problem is. You're on. <laughs> Yeah, I don't even want to it yeah. say anything. <laughs> Phil, I uh, Barry brought up a great point, and that was – how the Enterprise looked, it was gorgeous. There were some subtle changes, and I know that's something that you wanted to talk about specifically. I, yes, and bef- before I press on with that, Barry, the problem wasn't the Apple TV. It was the user, clearly. Um, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> the computer is um, only as smart as its user. That's right. Gar- <laughs> garbage in, garbage out. So, um, you know, I loved, loved the subtle changes to this Enterprise. I mean, you look at this ship, it is instantly identifiable as the Starship Enterprise we know and love. And there are some slight changes like the uh the the window view screen that uh, that Discovery has and like the the Kelvin Enterprise has. But you know, so I sent out a tweet earlier today that has gotten a lot of <laughs> a lot of traction. And it was a photo of the Enterprise and I I essentially said that I'm weary of hearing that after 50 plus years this is the only permissible depiction of the Starship Enterprise. I'm weary of canon. I'm weary of the gatekeeper fans. Give me good stories worthy of the name. That's what I care about. And Star Trek Discovery has done just that. And I think that's demonstrably true. So the ship doesn't look exactly the way it did in 1964 or 1966. Big deal. The producers have been upfront telling us from the get-go that there's going to be a visual refresh as part of this show. So things may not look exactly the same. And that makes sense because otherwise it would look like a 1966 TV show and no one's going to take that seriously in the context of a modern day uh, epic television series. That Enterprise we saw was almost the perfect cross between Matt Jeffrey's original design and the TMP refit from 1979, which made so many smart, beautiful choices that I looked at that ship last night and it just made my heart melt all over again, Dan. Well, here's the thing that I'd like to point out, and and you're absolutely right about everything that you just said. But, and I'm not, this isn't negative towards what you said. In, in looking at that Enterprise when it swooped in last night, yeah, it looked different. But we never saw the Enterprise prior to Kirk taking command, except for in the flashbacks or if you're watching the cage. So, 
just like people were talking about with the USS Defiant and the Mirror Universe, it looked different. The schematic on screen looked different. I'm not saying that this is the answer by no means, but there can be changes to any part of that ship over the course of 10 years. Hell, the entire fleet just almost got decimated during the Klingon War. You don't think that they're going to upgrade and do different things. Uh, it's a possibility. But I, I like what you're saying about the gatekeeper fans. It's got to stop or it's got to be lessened a little bit. Everybody has their opinion and everybody has their right to their opinion. And I'm not saying whether that opinion's right or wrong. It's just the same thing over and over again. And sometimes it gets a little weary. Well, and let's be honest about what gatekeeper fans are too. I mean, I'm not talking about anyone that disagrees that that the Enterprise looks okay. That's not what a gatekeeper fan is. A gatekeeper mm-hmm. fan is somebody who is so strident and rigid in their view of what Star Trek is that they feel that it's it's their personal job to defend uh, the, the Star Trek way of life and to, to, to determine what is and what is not Star Trek. That's what a gatekeeper fan is. It's it, it's a detriment to all of fandom. You know, why can't we just love the things we love, right? Infinite diversity, right. infinite combinations. Absolutely. That has to apply to the stories we tell and the manner in which we tell them in addition to the world that we all respect. Coming from a uh, a podcast that has the uh, sort of a play on the word politics, I would agree with you guys completely that I think this is a seepage of a I'm right and you're wrong and there is no middle ground sort of system of of communication that we have descended into uh, as of late and i think there are people who are going to like certain things who are going to dislike certain things about every show and i mean i definitely have some criticisms about about star trek discovery but they're constructive they're they're not because i hate this i i hate it and everyone else should hate it and blah 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 and it's the same thing of loving it too is if someone says i don't love star trek discovery i don't think there there's a problem with that i think it's it, there's room for it i feel i feel the the ghost of jim morehouse floating around us right now going <laughs> no wrong answers and, I, and he's right he, that that's a that's a mantra that that we i think we really need to start looking at even deeper into our our society as well and for it to have seeped into such a wonderful community of of star trek fans it's it is disappointing and it's nice to find safe havens where we can actually talk about the ins and outs of each show with with constructiveness in mind even if we say don't like a certain element or something right Absolutely agree. One of the things that I like so much about the discussions that we have here on Discovering Trek is this episode, we all agreed, wasn't the strongest one of the season, but yet we we still have positive things to say about it. And the things that concerned us a little bit, we have good dialogue, and I think that's what's important. And I thank you guys for that very much. Each week, we reserve this special time to reflect on those who we've lost in this week's episode of Star Trek Discovery. It's the somber part of our show but we feel it's the least we can do for those who have paid the ultimate price. We like to call it the Red Shirt Roll Call. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. 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 Discovery is a Star Trek show where we will lose crew and we will lose characters. That much is certain. But, um, Bill, uh, unless I'm missing something... We may actually have a clean slate this week, buddy. You know, buck up, cadets, because it's a beautiful day in the Federation. The war with the Klingons is over. It didn't take four years. And um, nobody died this week, Dan, so we get to celebrate. There's peace and happiness and a bright future for the Federation. And there were no, repeat, no casualties in episode 15 (laughs) of Star Trek Discovery. So a great day was had by all. And um, here's to season two, buddy. That is fantastic news. You know what? I say that we raise a glass of Synthahol this week anyway, in honor of all those people that we lost during the 14 previous episodes, as we say goodbye in this week's Red Shirt Roll Call. This week's episode is brought to you by Fansets, our exclusive sponsor for Discovering Trek. And it's time for this week's exclusive discount code. Just enter the code NCC1701. That's NCC1701 with capital letters for the NCC part at checkout for, get this, 20% off your entire order on fansets.com. Yes, you heard that right. 20 
25% off your order. So get your orders in now because this code is only going to be available to use until Sunday, February 25th, 2018 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. That is fantastic news, man, because not only is it double the percentage off, it's double the time to use that special code. So we want to thank Fansets for that very much. But hey, I have some special news straight from the folks at Fansets that just came in. Now that season one is over and Michael is back in Starfleet, the unranked version of the Michael Burnham pin, or Specialist Burnham, as she was known, will be retired once that pin has sold out. So head on over to fansets.com and place your order today. Fansets, a set for every fan and a fan for every set. And as always, we thank our friends at Fansets for being our exclusive sponsor for the entire first season of Discovering Trek. Of all the souls I have encountered in my travels, his was the most human. Star Trek has always been a reflection of our times. And in this segment, we take a look at what this episode helps us discover about humanity, or perhaps even what it tells us about ourselves. And I think this week may have been one of the easier weeks to point out uh, humanity uh, in our sensor analysis this week. So, Barry, uh, let's start with you, my friend. And uh, what did you think and what did you jot down for what you saw in this finale? Oh, sorry. I was on the Fansets website getting pins ready here. That's amazing. Sorry. I had to just <laughs> allow it. Yeah. Um, this, this ties things up, and this is a bit of a hint into where I'm going with all of this. My, my big focus was Ash slash Voke and his connection to Roman and Greek mythology especially. Um, he very much has the two faces of Janus, which is a, a Roman god who has two faces. And uh, more or less, to give you an idea, just reading uh, from Wikipedia here, he's the god of beginnings, gates, transitions, time, duality, doorways, passages, and endings. And he's usually depicted in having, having the two faces. And I think about just his story and seeing both sides. And I find that so incredibly fascinating about how we see both sides of a lot of things when we make choices, you know, in, in, in our day to day life, in larger situations that, that we experience internationally, nationally, there's always two sides to every story. The, the enemy's story is a lot like mine is a quote that I keep in my head quite a bit. And obviously, the discovery writers decided to deep dive quite a bit into Roman mythology, into talking about the disasters that we as a society have faced in our time and how we handle other cultures. And I think to a degree, what you see in, in Vogue is, is something amazing in how he has to at first kind of deny one side of himself and then suddenly wanting to keep it and have it and become incredibly violent when he f discovers the vokeness in him. And then later having to come to terms with that part might be somewhat, you know, sort of dead. I'm not terribly sure again, those lasers that Laurel used, what exactly they did. I think they ultimately kind of killed Voke, but didn't kill his memories. But Ash sees both sides of this. He sees sort of a thing that that I think most of us would really want to know, like to be able to sort of see things through someone else's eyes is probably the best way to get an understanding of where they're coming from. So that ties up so incredibly well with with his decision to to go and help the 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 Klingon Empire and and maybe we might might see sort of hints of that, you know, maybe it's a retcon. I don't know. it, it gets it, but it, I think it Sorry, I think it puts us in a really good place to see where the Klingons end up, say, in the TNG Deep Space Nine era. So that's really my my big point was just watching uh, Ash and Voke's arc and how special it was. Excellent points, as always. Uh, Bill, you are fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should be after that. God. No, that, just kidding. Uh, Barry, that was great, man. Uh, Bill, I know you always have good stuff in the segment, and uh, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. You know, watching the, the last 15 minutes of the episode, I, I found them really emotional for me because I, I felt that it spoke to pretty much the, the real heart of Star Trek, you know, about that bright future, about that, that optimism. And because there wasn't a whole lot of optimism during the war, but 
you know, like we've said, this is a, uh, this was a different time for Starfleet. And I suppose that the, the best way I can sum it up is to, is to quote directly from the episode. And that is quote, the only way to defeat fear is to tell it. No, no, we will not take shortcuts on the path to righteousness. No, we will not break the rules that protect us from our basest instincts. And no, we will not allow desperation to destroy moral authority. You know, these are words that apply to our present day now more than ever. We're a world living in fear, fear of an uncertain future, fear of the here and now, fear of the consequences of action by a body politic that is deaf on both sides of the aisle, pretty much regardless of which nation you live in. Star Trek tells us of a future where an organization like Starfleet does the right thing. And now more than ever, we have to be Starfleet. We are Starfleet. And by that, I mean, we are Starfleet. We are that bold spirit that explores the galaxy in the future. We, we are those inquisitive people who want to know more about the things out there. We are those people who will have to hold ourselves and humanity to a higher standard. All season long, the Starfleet has had to do some very un-Starfleet things to ensure their survival. And now we've come around to the optimism and bright future. And we too will have to cross that bridge someday, but we must say no to our baser instincts and to the negativity. We are the future. And to defeat that fear, we must tell it no, Dan. I quit. Dan, okay, you're, re- you're, you're rehired. <laughs> <laughs> I can't beat that. Very good points, man. Very, very good points. You know, as I sat and watched the finale of Discovery, I was disgusted and at almost the same time was reinvigorated at humanity while watching the episode. I was disgusted that the upper brass at Starfleet could stoop as low as to committing genocide and destroying an entire planet to win the war and that they had short-sightedness for not having any other plan other than to give a maniac from an alternate universe a bomb to plant on the Klingon homeworld. Uh, You know, the levels that we stoop to to try and get what we want can sometimes sicken me. I've said it before. You know, whether or not it's war and whether or not it's a time of desperation, to me, is irrelevant. There's, There's morals and scruples that we have to hold on to to remain human. And it seemed that some people in Starfleet had lost those morals. Uh, we should never believe that wiping out a species is the only way to bring peace. But but then, at almost the same time, I was overjoyed that one crew on one starship was able to turn the tide. You know, rising in unison to come together to find another way. It was it was wonderful. We are Starfleet, and we will never abandon our beliefs. They were saying. Uh, we'll find a way to be better than the rest, and we'll find a way to bring peace and happiness wherever we go. This is the Star Trek that people have been accusing Discovery of not being all season long. And even if some were blinded to it through the season, it was always there. And it never shined more brightly than it did in episode 15 when Burnham, Saru, and the rest of the crew stood up to Admiral Cornwell and came up with a better way to bring peace. Gentlemen, it's that time for Starfleet commendations. Uh, this is the part of the show that I always like because we get to hear what was the favorite parts for, for all the people involved in the discussion. Let's uh, pick a few things that you want to specifically call out uh, in the episode, whether it's characters or performances or just specific scenes and, and why you think they're worthy of that recognition. I'll start off with uh, saying that Sarek and Burnham scenes in Paris were just heartwarming. Uh, Burnham calling Sarek father and Sarek calling her daughter. It, it was a great way to show that those feelings have always been there, even though we saw that uh, troublesome time between the two of them. Um, when he placed that Starfleet insignia on her uniform, it literally gave me goosebumps. I thought it was fantastic. Um, and also speaking of Burnham, I thought the speech that she gave after she was uh, um, her record got expunged, that scene was terrific and one of the reasons i liked it so much was you got to see the crew with their medals of honor um and it was very touching to me that stamets was holding culbers in both of his hands i thought that was a great moment tilly now an ensign i loved seeing that and she winked at burnham i thought that was great as well 
And then the part that I really liked about the scene is when Burnham turned around and the audience was clapping and they were scanning the audience and you saw different variations of Starfleet uniforms, including what we saw on the USS Enterprise during the cage times, which, oh, by the way, we just saw the Enterprise at the end of this episode. The writers are doing what we want them to do. They are going to explain why they're different uniforms because that was a big question when the series first started. I loved how they did that and kept that continuity going. And finally, I just want to say once again, that final scene. Oh, my God, that final scene. Uh, as I said earlier, my wife knew that something was wrong when they went to warp. And then we got the hints. We got the distress call. We had NCC showing up on one of the consoles. And then we were told that Captain Pike was 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 reaching out or, or sending a signal. Uh, the way that that ship swooped in and went nose to nose to the Discovery, I was just so overjoyed. Seeing our old friend again was an amazing feeling. Uh, I've said it before. Some people are bitching about it, not looking correct. But as with the Defiant and the Mirror Universe, it just could be upgrades. It could be anything. Bill talked about it at length, so we won't get into that again. Um, I just love it. People sometimes also say that, you know, it's nothing but fan service when the writers do something like this. Well, as a fan, I'm okay with it, and I loved it. It's the most non-forced thing I've seen on Discovery all year. And I want to thank the writers for doing what – as Star Trek fans, they would want to see as well. Bravo. Barry, commendations, oh, my oh man. Boy. First, first commendation has to go to Sonequa Martin-Green. She carried this show from stem to stern, and she demonstrates in, I would say, the most visceral way how a Starfleet officer is forged. Her, her, her ups and her downs, her uncertainty, her arc towards justice and her arc towards being the hero that was inside of her, you know, just was, was a tour de force. I, I just tip my hat to um, her, her ability to act a character with so much depth and so much emotion and yet also be struggling with that emotion all of the time. The fact that she had to endure what she did as well with the revelations about Ash and Voke as well. She carried that, that scene with, with the right amount of hurt and dignity at the same time. Just, yeah, I, I definitely have to high five her if I ever get a chance to meet her. Cause she's really, really great. My next commendation goes to uh, um, obviously Tilly. Tilly kills it. Killy Tilly. She's so so much fun to watch. Just a uh, uh, a joy to to see sort of work through herself. You know, as as I sort of said earlier, and those little bits of comic relief. She she would steal the show from time to time. Third commendation goes to um, Mary Shifo playing Laurel. She emotes so well with her eyes. I loved it when. It was mentioned, I don't know, I don't think it was in this episode, but it's mentioned that, you know, oh, the Klingons won the war and you just see like a fire start in her eyes and you're like, oh, my goodness. Or the way she could sort of carry the the the, the scenes when, when she was with Voke at the very beginning on the Shenzhou. Again, under all of that makeup, she was able to really bring out her true character. And finally, of course, the Enterprise. She's back. I'm so happy to see her. <laughs> That sums it up pretty well, doesn't it? Just one, five words. One, two, three, four, five. Just good to see her. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely great to see her. Math is hard. Um, and with that, uh, Bill, I know you always have some good stuff too, man. Let's hear it. You know, I have to continue along Barry's uh, last comment. I have to give a commendation to the VFX team. That shot of the Enterprise was just glorious, and it was perfect for the show. She was rendered with love and care. And I tell you what, she was true to the glory of Matt Jeffrey's original design. So I have to say that was just top shelf stuff. Um, my second commendation is for the entire cast of Star Trek Discovery. You know, thank you for your hard work and the characters that you've portrayed all season long. You've taken us on a ride that has been a joy to be on after all this time. And we're so excited to continue on with you in season two. I know all three of us are, are all in and we can't wait to see what you have. And then lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the writers and all of the other creatives, you know, behind the camera and and, and doing all the things that make this show as, as amazing as it is. Thank you for your amazing work that has been born out of your love for this fandom and for this thing that we all hold so dear. And more importantly, thanks for keeping the franchise alive for a brand new generation of Trekkies that are going to spawn from this series and for all the journeys we have yet to go on, Dan. 
Well said. That, that was perfect. Love it. Long range scan of planet complete. So guys, uh, season one's done. So we're not going to do a uh, long range scan for the rest of the season because that would be kind of silly. Uh, but we are still going to do a long range scan because that's what we do here at this part of Discovering Trek. So Barry, let's take a look at the orb of time. What do you think is going to happen on season two of Star Trek Discovery? I am a little bit at a loss because obviously the, I, I don't think the Klingons are going to play as heavy a role, but I think it's going to be showing a lot more familiar faces. So obviously um, there's talk of obviously we need to now crew the Enterprise. And and of course, I don't think a lot of the characters who once played are going to be I don't know if they're, I, I really hope they don't go the way of like 3D rendering or anything like that. I hope they just recast, but we, we can talk about that more in a bit. Also, the interiors, uh, the interior of the Enterprise, I think would be really fascinating to see as well. But yeah, I still hope though that though we see some familiar faces, I hope Discovery gets to sort of do its own thing. It's not going to be just you know, jumping back and forth from, from familiarity to familiarity. I really want to sort of boldly go into some, some other deep, dark recesses that, that the first season took us in. I was not expecting the mirror universe. And I'm also feeling pretty good because when they come into their sophomore year, I'm, I've, I've got a lot of confidence in the writers, what they've learned from this series and how they're going to build something better. So to be honest, I don't know what they're going to do next, but I'm, I'm all in. I have to agree with you there that uh, it's good to see some of these things brought back. I love the idea of seeing the Enterprise and and hearing Captain Pike's name. But Discovery is a show that has been proven already that it can stand on its own two feet. So I hope it's not something that they're going to go to that well too many times. But I do want to see it from time to time because it just makes me smile. So, uh, Bill, what do you have for your long range scan for season two, man? Well, my long range scan is this, Dan. I believe we are not going to see Spock in season two of Discovery, um, nor necessarily do I think we should. And that's based on the presence of Sarek on the bridge of the Discovery. Um, we know that in Journey to Babel that they really haven't talked since Spock left for Starfleet. And if Sarek is there, that makes it awfully hard to avoid that encounter. So I'm going to err on the side of saying that... Um, we may see a crew aboard the Enterprise, but I don't think Spock's going to be on it just yet. That'll be very interesting because, as we know, he was the science officer for Captain Pike for over a decade. I think 13 years, if I remember correctly, from the menagerie. But uh, we will see. That kind of plays into what I'm thinking for the long-range scan is, obviously, this crew is going to have some kind of adventure with Captain Pike and the Enterprise. If not one episode, maybe more than one. We shall see what happens there. I think it's going to be very interesting to see who plays Pike and if there is a Spock, who will play Spock. I have to kind of agree with Barry. We saw it in Rogue One. We've talked about it before. I, I don't know if it's going to if it's going to hurt or help if we see a digitally recreated Leonard Nimoy as Spock. Um, so we're, we'll find out. I guess we'll find out in uh, in season two. But I also am very interested and have no uh, uh, opinion or thought as to who could possibly be the new captain of the discovery. They were on their way to Vulcan to meet the new captain. I was kind of hoping Saru would be the new captain, but obviously that's not going to be the case. So that'll be interesting to see who takes over the good old NCC one zero three one. Did I get that right? Cause I've written down so many numbers. I did you get did. that right. You did. Math is math is hard. Math is hard. <laughs> Dan, as always, we want to thank our friends at Fansets for being the exclusive sponsor for Discovering Trek. You know, we've loved having them as our sponsor all season long, and we look forward to all the great new products they have coming out, Dan. Absolutely, we do. You know, Lou, John, and the entire team over at Fansets is just awesome. And speaking of awesome, they have a great way to celebrate the first season of Star Trek Discovery, and it's called the Episode Pin Collection. Just head on over to EpisodePins.com and check out all the details of how you can have unique pins for each episode of Discovery's first season. And now that season one has wrapped up, subscribers to this collection should be getting their newest pins very, very soon. The previews of the pins for the second half of the season have just been amazing, and we can't wait to see the final episode 15 pin. And speaking of pins, Dan, 
it is time to give away some of those pins to a lucky listener. This is my favorite part of the show. I, I don't know why, but I just love giving away fan set stuff. Now, as you may recall, last week we wanted you to tweet out your thoughts on episode 14 with a special hashtag. Well, we've taken all of your great responses and would like to congratulate our friend Haley Stoddart, who is on Twitter at Trekkie01D. Haley, you've just won the TNG Mirror Universe micro crew pin set, which includes Picard, Riker, Data, Troy, and Crusher. That's so awesome. Crushing it. I love it. Congratulations, Haley. You know, she's a great supporter of fan sets, Trek geeks, and Discovering Trek. So I'm really thrilled uh, that she's getting the Mirror Universe pin. So that's another plus on my side. So that's good. Uh, congrats, Haley. Uh, so, Bill, I've got some news that even you are not aware of yet. Oh? Did you know? Yes. You know, Lou from fan sets and I have been acting like Sarek and Admiral Cornwell making backroom deals to bring listeners an absolutely amazing giveaway for this week's season finale. For the next two weeks, so for two full weeks, we want everyone who is listening to the show to send us a tweet telling us their thoughts on season one with a very special hashtag, and that is hashtag we are Starfleet. In two weeks' time, Bill and I are going to pick a winner from all of those who have participated, and that person is going to win an entire episode pin collection from fan sets. All wow. 15 pins plus, plus a portfolio to store those 15 pins in. That is awesome stuff. I am blown away. I had no idea that that was yes. going to be the special prize for this week. That is that is amazing. Wow. So It really is amazing. Yeah. Uh, one thing we do want to make sure that people are aware of is that these will be the 15 pins. It will not include the special uh, subscriber pin that people who subscribed during the beginning of season one uh, were able to get. So it will be the 15 episodic pins, but still, that's pretty incredible. That that's absolutely amazing, and thank you so much to to Fansets and, and to Lou and John and everybody there. So get your tweets out there by Monday, February twenty sixth, two thousand eighteen, at six p.m. Eastern time. And really, best of luck to everyone. And as always, our our sincere gratitude to Fansets for having been our exclusive sponsor all season long. So, uh, buddy, uh, we have no new episode to dissect next week. Um, the season's over. Uh, I don't know what to do. Um, I've kind of heard rumors that season two is not going to start for a while. Uh, can you help? What, what's, what's happening next here on discovering Trek? Well, first let me talk you off the ledge. I mean, they confirmed today that shooting does in fact start in April and that's just two okay. months from now. So take, take okay. a deep breath, mon frere. All right, Dan. It also is that two weeks from now, we're going to be back with a special season one wrap-up episode of Discovering Trek. We're going to talk about the entire season as a whole, and joining us to talk about that freshman season of Star Trek Discovery will be none other than Ken Ray from Mission Log, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. I am so excited to talk to Ken. He's a great friend of ours in this show, and uh, it's always a wonderful discussion whenever he's on the microphone. In the meantime, don't forget, we've made it easier for you to subscribe to both Trek Geeks and also Discovering Trek, a Star Trek Discovery Companion. Head on over to podfleet.com and find out how you can get both of our podcasts directly on your iPod, iPhone, Android, or other device. Plus, you can even stream both of our podcasts directly using Spotify, iHeartRadio, or Stitcher. They're your independent Star Trek podcasts delivered your way. So join our pod fleet and make it so, Dan. Absolutely. Make it so. Thank you so much, my good friend. Barry, thank you so much for joining us again here on Discovering Trek. I'd like to find out where folks can uh, hit you up on social media and please take some time to talk about your awesome new podcast, Politrex. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was just a, an absolute thrill getting to talk uh, with you guys about this episode and about Star Trek Discovery. You can find me specifically on Twitter at uh, Bjorn de Fjord. So just a kind of a play on my name, B-J-O-R-N-D-E-F-J-O-R-D. -E you can also find me on Facebook through Politrex. And then also on Twitter, you can follow us at Politrex. And just for everyone, if you are interested in, in listening to our show over on the Tricorder Transmissions podcast, 
podcast network. My my brother in Trek, Shashank Avaru, and I, we talk about current and historical events, politics, religion, and society, and it's all through a Star Trek lens. Kind of sort of like your guys' sensor analysis, as I mentioned uh, on the on episode 13. We do span every series. We try to span as much as possible and go into a lot of different facets, both political, moral, ethical, sometimes even spiritual and sort of how Star Trek and its characters represent that. We just uh, finished a really great interview with a, uh, a fantastic author who wrote uh, uh, Trekonomics. So we're looking forward to dropping that quite soon. So yeah, check us out. And uh, we are always happy to, uh, to be a part of this large, wonderful podcasting family. We love having you as part of the family, man. Uh, check it out, folks. Politrex is awesome, as are all of the podcasts over on the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. Uh, for us, that is going to do it for Episode 15 and for Season 1 of Star Trek Discovery. It has been an absolutely amazing ride, and we have had so much fun watching new Trek on television after so many years without having it. I look forward to being back soon for our special season one wrap up episode in a couple of weeks, but until then, here are some words of wisdom from Captain James T. Kirk in the episode Requiem for Methuselah that speaks to something we discuss every week here on Discovering Trek, our own humanity. To be human is to be complex. You can't avoid a little ugliness from within and from without. And until next time, never stop discovering. Music for Discovering Trek is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing one song for each episode of the original Star Trek. Download their music at fiveyearmission.net. Discovering Trek, a Star Trek Discovery Companion, is a production of Trek Geeks. Executive producer Dan Davidson. For even more Star Trek discussion, check out the Trek Geeks podcast, available on Apple Podcasts and trekgeeks.com.